this is this is Chris Salter uh, talking from Arecibo. Uh, today's talk in the ASAP talk series is by Dr. P.K. Menoran, and he is talking on solar radio imaging at Arecibo, the evolution of active regions. Uh, you will have all received a CV of uh, today's speaker with the invitation to this talk. Consequently, I thought I would just add a few personal details. I first met uh, PKM when I spent two years at TIFR in India from 1981 to 1983. Uh, when I returned for a further two years there in 1988 to 90, Manoran was nearing completion of his PhD, which was a remarkable study of a complete 11 year solar cycle of the solar wind using uh, the IPS technique, including his own uh, invented technique or developed technique for measuring solar wind velocities using a single telescope. We kept contact through his later sabbatical times, postdoctoral in Japan, France, and the USA, and for his 14 years when he was professor and director of the UT Radio Observatory with its huge low frequency telescope. He also served as vice president of the IAU Commission 49, which deals with interplanetary plasma and the heliosphere, as well as taking a number of other service roles of use and uh, for the benefit of the community. We were very lucky that in 2019, sadly, just after Tabazi and myself went to Green Bank, Manoran moved to Arecibo and established a multi-frequency interplanetary scintillation program with a 305 meter telescope. Watch the journals, please, for exciting results that came from that program before the tragic demise of the big dish. And there are some very exciting results. Never uh, dismayed for long by setbacks such as the collapse of the big telescope, tragic collapse. Uh, he moves his research onto the helio of, of the heliosphere, onto the AO 12 meter telescope and to the AO Callisto facility, uh, which I, I believe he was the main mover in getting set up at Arecibo. He will talk about that, I think, today. Uh, it's this he will be talking about to us. Uh, I'll just add that as questions occur to you, please enter them in the Zoom chat. You'll find that down in the bottom row of your Zoom window. And uh, Tracy Becker has kindly offered to act as moderator at the end of the talk and to put these questions to the speaker at uh, that point. Okay. Can I invite uh, Manoran, please, to uh, now open up his talk and uh, tell us all about the uh, the so solar radio imaging at Arecibo, please. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. You added uh, colors to the introduction. <clears throat> thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, ASAP members for giving me this opportunity. I'm very happy to share with you uh, the results from, uh, recent results from the uh, Arcebo uh, 12 meter radio telescope. Can I share my screen? I believe you can. I think uh, my it should work. is uh, shareable. Okay, can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. 
Uh, I will I will uh, 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 share with you some of the recent results from uh, solar radio imaging uh, with the 12 meter radio telescope, and the results are um, uh, particularly evolution of uh, active regions actually. So I would like to I would like to uh, introduce uh, uh, my colleagues and the friends uh, Chris, uh, Stefan, and the Tabasi Ben. Cristiano, Phil, Felix, and uh, Arun uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, collaborative work. So Arecibo Observatory is operated by the University of Central Florida under a cooperative agreement with the National Science Foundation. Uh, this is a National Science Foundation uh, facility. Okay, so I have a, I have an introduction. I will give a, um, a brief introduction about um, uh, Callisto and uh, 12 meter. And uh, then I will go for uh, uh, solar imaging with the 12 meter and uh, uh, how we, we see the uh, evolution in the um, uh, solar X-band uh, data and uh, some coronal mass ejection recorded using uh, 12 meter. And um, so I will also uh, uh, include uh, how the X-band emission uh, varies with the solar activity, and then I'll try to summarize. Right. Okay, the radio sun, sun continuously varies on all time scale. Solar activity arises due to the magnetic field on the sun. The, the look of the sun, the beautiful look or beautiful face of the sun or the changing face of the sun is due to the magnetic field on the sun. So the radio uh, emissions are signatures of complex thermal and non-thermal plasma processes occurring at different levels in the, in the chromosphere, corona, and the interplanetary medium. The mechanism of, uh, mechanisms are uh, free-free emission from star and, and gyro synchrotron emission, plasma emission, and uh, gyro resonance emission, etc. And also the radio brightening or the radio uh, uh, emission increase can be slight increase to several orders of uh, magnitude increase in a uh, um, few seconds to uh, uh, this thing, very short time actually. Some of the specific radio events are associated with transient eruptions like uh, intense flares and uh, coronal mass ejection, which drive intense geoeffective disturbance um, at the magnetosphere, actually. So, the, we, we started uh, solar monitoring after the collapse of the 305 uh, uh, legacy telescope. So, we installed a Callisto and then we the 12 meter antenna was brought back in uh, operation. And then, Callisto operation started uh, on 10th October 2021. And, uh, uh, regular observations are going on even now, and it covers frequency, low frequency of 20 mahertz to 100 mahertz. And um, uh, we have recorded uh, recorded a huge number of uh, uh, different types of uh, radio bursts. Particularly, we have recorded a large number of type 2 bursts, which are uh, useful for uh, uh, shocks associated with the coronal mass ejection. And then the Callisto data is made available uh, every 30 minutes uh, uh, on the website, actually. So this, is, uh, this data is made available online immediately after the observation. And, uh, and 12 meter uh, solar monitoring started uh, around mid-December 2021, and uh, it's going on successfully even um, today. Today, observation uh, was... Uh, uh, interesting observation. And then these studies, Callisto as well as uh, 12 meter combined together, uh, we try to uh, initiate uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, studies of space weather effects at uh, a near Earth environment. <clears throat> this uh, solar monitoring, I'll, I'll introduce uh, 12 meter. 12 meter, many of you uh, might have used this telescope also. The primary purpose of this telescope was space referencing of VLB observation made with the Arecibo Legacy 305 telescope. And uh, it can cover a declination um, uh, from minus 65 degree, 65 degrees south to 
above all the uh, declination. Currently, it operates uh, with a room temperature receiver. It, it's a uh, gas green, covers the S band and the X band. And the S band has a uh, limited uh, bandwidth. X band has about uh, one gigahertz bandwidth. So it is connected to a MOX spectrometer, which records a dual polarization signal and seven independent uh, frequency channels. So the current observing programs are solar mapping, also our monitoring, spectral line studies, uh, continuum radio source monitoring, VLBI, plus several observational projects for undergraduate uh, students. So I would like to, I like to uh, mention the important point, the 12 meter uh, radio telescope is now being upgraded with a wide band cooled system, which covers uh, two to 14 gigahertz. And it is expected to be operational in a couple of uh, months, actually. So, so this has a huge uh, uh, um, uh, bandwidth. <laughs> and then the, the Callisto is part of the worldwide uh, uh, network of uh, solar spectrometer, actually. So the Atlantic time zone, uh, uh, there was a gap in the solar observation. So the EO, um, uh, Callisto plays a very important role, very important role in covering the Atlantic time zone. And I, 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 I'm very happy to record that uh, Evo Callisto uh, is one of the or one of the best uh, Callisto uh, recording uh, in this uh, uh, time zone. Actually, so if, if somebody is interested, they can see this paper actually worldwide. Uh, and network of uh, uh, radio spectrometer actually. So this plot shows um, this. Uh, so some of the uh, sample spectra made with the Arecibo Callisto. So this in the December, November spectrum, and then September, and then again November spectrum. So we we record we have recorded several uh, type two radio buses, slow drift frequency drifting. Type two bus. This uh, frequency drip uh, gives the uh, speed of the shock, and uh, one can uh, determine the initial speed of the CME, which is very crucial in understanding the geo effectiveness of CME as well as the particle acceleration. In front of the shock, uh, the energetic uh, particles are accelerated, and then uh, the, the, this is the uh, type three. For example, in, in uh, uh, November, we observed an intense uh, type 3 event, actually. It was a real intense uh, type 3 event. This was associated with a, with a jet. OK, you, you can see this is the SDO image at 19.3 nanometer. So the uh, jet uh, uh, produced the, uh, produced the uh, uh, type 3. So several other um, type two examples are also shown. Actually, type three at uh, plasma, type three emission at plasma frequency, both fundamental and harmonic. So they are produced by beams of electron moving along the open field flux, actually. So as we go higher above the corona, so uh, the corona can be probed with uh, uh, lower and lower frequency. So, uh, the multi-frequency observations of uh, type 3 or multi-frequency uh, multi radio observation gives the uh, diagnostic of uh, um, a coronal density as a function of height. So type 3, uh, slow drifting uh, radio was, this was again October 2022. So this is associated with the pro propagation of shocks in the corona and heliosphere. And also, as I mentioned, type three, uh, type two bus are important in understanding energetic particle acceleration in front of the shock. And uh, shocks also sometimes uh, hit the earth and then they produce uh, um, shock sudden commencement at the, at the manotosphere. So um, uh, the low frequency observations, are, uh, radio observations are made using the uh, spacecraft observation like uh, wind, stereo space, and synthesis wrap, and other space missions. And then ground-based observations covers a frequency greater than 15 minutes, actually. So <clears throat> the 12 meter uh, radio telescope um, uh, solar imaging, say every day we take east-west raster scan of the sun, 
in the frequency interval of 8.1 to 9.2 gigahertz and simultaneously maps are made at frequency intervals of 170 mahertz that is seven maps are made in this uh, frequency range so these maps are useful to handle the uh, rfi radio frequency interference which present in the observation so they are very useful actually and then 12 meter radio telescope spatial resolution is limited actually nevertheless these maps provide a clear view of the emission brightness temperature of active region as well as the quiet region. For example, the, the, this map shows the uh, 12 meter image taken on 16th May 2022. And uh, we could clearly see the strong emitting region and then uh, the low emitting region. The low emitting region corresponds to coronal hole. Coronal holes are open field. Uh, uh, configuration on the sun actually. So they are low density and then uh, X-ray and UV and other uh, emissions are low from the uh, coronal hole, whereas the active regions, the high uh, bright emitting active region, they are made up of a closed field uh, magnetic configuration. So we could see that actually. And this, for example, this, this coronal hole, at the middle of the sun was seen in uh, with a low resolution uh, 12 meters. So regular mon monitoring is useful to follow the active region as it rotates from east limb of the sun to the west limb of the sun. And also ev every day we make uh, five to 10 maps, okay, um, excluding some maintenance period and the other observing programs, okay. Okay, so the actually this uh, this uh, image shows the uh, shows the uh, emission from five gigahertz, eight gigahertz, and eleven gigahertz uh, frequency. The eleven gigahertz lies close to the photosphere, the yellow uh, yellow region, and then above the yellow there is a carpet uh, purple uh, colored carpet. And then above the purple colored carpet, green carpet can be uh, seen. The green carpet corresponds to uh, five gigahertz, and then eight, uh, the uh, purple corresponds to eight gigahertz. So the depending on the wavelength of uh, observation, we can we can probe uh, different uh, layers are from the uh, above the photosphere. A centimeter the really incoherent. Uh, zero synchrotron emission dominates. So the the centimeter wavelength, for example, five to ten gigahertz, the synchrotron uh, emission dominates. The synchrotron emission is sensitive to orientation of the magnetic field as well as the strength of the magnetic field. It offers variable uh, the thing um, valuable probe for energetic electron accelerator during solar flares as well as the associated magnetic field and the energy release processes. Okay, so the 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 centimeter wave uh, uh, emission peaks around five to ten gigahertz. Okay, the um, positive slope falls in the optically uh, thick region, and the negative slope falls optically uh, thin re region. So this uh, plot was made by uh, Tim Bastian, okay, the NRIO. So here the uh, map. Uh, mapping results of one month is uh, shown. So the this uh, this image uh, is from a twelve meter radio telescope. For comparison, <clears throat> comparison SDO uh, dynamic observatory uh, UV image as well as the manodograms are shown actually. So the UV image is uh, nineteen point three uh, nanometer image. So we could we could um, see the 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 active region as it rotates from the east limb of the sun to the west limb of the uh, sun. See the the zero synchrotron radiation from high energy electron trapped in small scale uh, magnetic loops. Bright regions are zero resonance emitting regions actually. Okay. So this is this is uh, th these kind of uh, movies are made for uh, for every month and uh, and I'm working with uh, Arun to uh, to 
to make it available in the website for others also. Even now we are sharing our images with uh, others uh, um, who are interested actually. So in the, uh, the uh, in space weather perspective of solar event, let us see. The magnetic field in the solar atmosphere essentially controls the plasma structure and storage of pre-magnetic energy. The sudden release of magnetic energy on the sun drives powerful solar plates and coronal mass ejection. But the key uh, difficulty is how to predict the occurrence of time and location of strong solar eruption, actually. Those leading to high impact space weather disturbance at the uh, near Earth environment, or how to predict the Earth directed uh, CME or Earth directed uh, flares. So that's the key key difficulty. And the the twelve meter radio telescope gives some some uh, hand or some uh, useful uh, direction in predicting the. Uh, complexity of the uh, magnetic region. The active region coupled to sunspot groups of complex polarity. So uh, we call it as delta spot magnetic configuration as per a Hale and Mount Wilson scheme are prone to produce uh, significantly intense flares actually. So the expand imaging is useful to follow the evolution of active region uh, susceptible to intense uh, uh, flares. Actually, we, we saw in this image the one month uh, one month uh, data so as we as as we observe so we follow the active region if the active region uh, brightness temperature is increasing so we have a clue to predict the uh, active region uh, active region uh, um, complexity so I, actually i will not explain too much uh, of this slide so the configurations are alpha, beta, and beta, gamma, gamma, delta. So the complexity increases from unipolar sunspot to multipolar uh, uh, sunspot group, actually. So the complexity increases from alpha to delta. So, okay, let me keep this. So this plot shows the, the 12 meter um, uh, um, um, peak uh, uh, brightness temperature. Uh, for uh, some uh, something 13th uh, December to uh, beginning of August, something like it covers something like 240 days. So in the in the 12 meter observation, we see regular increase and decrease. So, so the the corresponds to active region crossing the crossing the uh, east limit to west limit, but some peaks are very prominent actually. So. Okay, so this, for example, the marker with the A, B, C, these three peaks are prominent. Here, the UV radiation is plotted, and here, soft X-ray from Gauss X-ray, and this UV from SDO. In those plots also, we see systematic increase and decrease due to active region uh, passing from east limb to west limb of the sun. But, Compared to compared to this prominent peak, these prominent peaks are not seen in, um, uh, in prominently not seen in uh, uh, seen in UV and uh, X-ray emission. So these peaks corresponds to emission from multipole magnetically active beta gamma delta region developed on the sun, and from where intense flares were observed. Actually, for example, when the temperature when the temperature was uh, 13,000 uh, Kelvin and above, we started observing M-class flares. So the flare cl classification goes as A, B, C, M, X, actually. So M-class flares are intense flares. X-class flares are very intense flares, actually. X-class flares were observed when the peak uh, brightness temperature was uh, up the order of uh, 20,000 Kelvin. So as as the active region develops okay we could we could uh, we could uh, infer the complexity of the uh, complexity of the active region so another interesting uh, interesting results came out of this uh, uh, this uh, plot is the we see uh, the quiet sun emission which is around uh, um, uh, 8000 uh, kelvin so that corresponds to corresponds to mid chromospheric region, something like uh, five thousand kilometer above the um, 
above the photosphere. So, so the as a byproduct, we could uh, we could get the um, we could get the um, uh, Quetzal emission also. So, so these the, these observations have been made, and then we could follow several active regions actually. For example, the here the um, nanogram and the 12 meter images are shown for three days. So we could see the, the complex uh, uh, active region. Um, this was on 29th March. This active region produced a first X class flare of the uh, current solar cycle. Actually, on 30th March, we observed the X class flare. Actually. And um, uh, again, this active region also produced a on X class player, and then the complexity, <clears throat> and also the, the this active this active region uh, emission corresponds to something like thirteen thousand to sixteen thousand uh, Kelvin. The magnetic configuration was uh, beta gamma and beta gamma delta configuration. So uh, the twelve meter observations are uh, extremely useful to follow the uh, magnetic complexity or magnetic configuration of the active region. Actually. So here uh, in this plot, the horizontal uh, axis is the uh, day number, and the vertical axis is the peak uh, flux of an active region. Active region 3153, which appeared in the uh, first half of uh, December 2022. So we could see the uh, the development of the active region as the as the active region developed. We could see the increase in uh, increase in uh, peak um, brightness uh, temperature, and then the active region reached uh, something like uh, beta gamma or beta uh, delta configuration and then decayed. So this was compared with, uh, when I compared this with the number of visible spot in the active region. So the each active region can have large number of uh, sunspots. If less number of sunspots are there, then they, they become simple active region as the number of uh, visible sunspot increases or as the flux uh, em, uh, emergence increases in an active region, it can lead to complexity. So we see a nice uh, uh, correlation between the uh, peak um, uh, brightness uh, temperature and the number of visible spot present in the active region. Okay. So this is... Uh, so this in this period, the active region was close to the east limb, and here the active region was close to the close to the central meridian, and then uh, active region uh, went to the west limb of the sun. Okay, so this this is for another active region, thirty eighty nine active region number thirty eighty nine. So when the when the um, uh, peak uh, temperature uh, the temperature um, uh, peaked, so the active region uh, reached a beta gamma delta configuration. Actually, we, we have a plan to compare the temperature of the magnetic flux density of the active region. So uh, I wanted to do uh, that, uh, um, that analysis uh, before the talk, but I could not complete. So, so uh, here I compare number of visible sunspot. If I compare the magnetic flux density, the flux per unit area. So how they compare, so that will be an interesting result, uh, I think. Okay. So here again, uh, the April uh, active region 20, 20, 29, 93 is shown. This was the return of the active region, which produced the first uh, uh, X-class uh, flare. In the previous rotation, it produced a X-class flare. When it returned, some active regions, they live longer, and then they, uh, they uh, live for several uh, solar uh, rotation, actually. So here we see the um, um, uh, nice correlation between the number of sunspot and the active region. So when the active region was at the peak, the magnetic um, uh, configuration was complex. So if you see this uh, plot, actually, so this shows the, this is potential field um, source surface model extrapolation uh, magnetic field. So uh, on top of the active region, we see several closed uh, field configuration. So the magnetic field is uh, really the complex, this complex uh, short uh, scale magnetic uh, loops 
produce uh, uh, intense uh, emission. Actually. Okay. So here, this plot, I, uh, I compared the number of visible sunspots in the vertical axis. And then every day, average brightness temperature of the active region. So we could see, a, we could see a, uh, this plot shows a, a lot of scatter. In some of it, the correlation was something like 65 to 70% uh, uh, correlation we could see. Actually, there is a, there is a, there is a uh, um, um, the preventing line actually. Which uh, uh, which gives the information about the about the um, uh, number of visible spot uh, for high uh, brightness uh, temperature. <clears throat> okay, so we, uh, the twelve meter. Okay, so far we have compared the active region peak brightness and the active region peak brightness uh, um, evolution as a function of time and also active region uh, peak brightness correlation with uh, number of visible spot on a given active region. So we could uh, this record some uh, CMEs also, for example, the, the first X-class flare on 30 March uh, uh, was recorded with uh, um, EO uh, Callisto uh, spectrometer. It produced the intense uh, um, uh, uh, type three as well as uh, uh, type two bus, the type three bus was uh, very fast. It was uh, something like 1,000, 1,400 kilometer. And we also recorded the moving type four bus. This plot shows the X-ray, uh, soft X-ray profile up from GO-16 satellite. So um, the soft X-ray um, profiles are useful to classify the A class, B class, and C class, and the M class, X class players actually. So this movie shows the um, um, UV, um, UV uh, this movie has been made using the UV images made with the SDO uh, solar dynamic observatory uh, UV images. <clears throat> so the eruption was um, in the initial field of the eruption was something like uh, five to 600 kilometer, but uh, within um, uh, two to three solar radii, the speed increased to 1,400 to 1,500 kilometers. So the CME was uh, um, highly accelerating uh, CME. So this this um, uh, CME could be um, observed uh, uh, could be observed with the 12 meter uh, uh, imaging. So this shows the time A, time B, and then this is the uh, difference between these two images. So the difference image shows the emission from the active region as well as the the filament erupted filament channel uh, from uh, from the active region. So this was uh, th again this is another uh, difference image. So on that day we had uh, several observation. So the, this observation was um, um, uh, subtracted from the previous observation and this observation was subtracted from the uh, next image. So in the both images, we could see the subtracted image, we could see the uh, filament um, uh, moving out of the out of the active region. So more, more analysis will be done on this. On the April 2nd uh, uh, event, it, it produced a nice uh, particle uh, event. This is the uh, proton uh, event at, um, at 150 and uh, 10 MeV range. So this this shock observed with the Evo uh, Callisto um, um, gave a shock speed of uh, something like um, something like uh, 1,500 kilometer, and then the Halo CME was 1,400 kilometer. Again, it was not a, a X-class player. It was a M3.9 player, but uh, this produced a various uh, uh, solar radioactivity. So this even um, uh, in the UV, we could see the nice uh, um, um, eruption actually. So the the in the uh, 10 30.4 nanometer we don't see the uh, leg brightness but whereas the the 12 meter uh, uh, radio imaging gave the brightness of the this is the difference image it gave the um, 
or brightness of the uh, leg actually. So this was the uh, chronograph uh, uh, movie taken with the NASCO C2 chronograph actually. So here we could see the uh, UV CME onset seen in the uh, white light LASCO field of view. Okay. It was an interesting event. And um, the, the, here I show one set of uh, subtracted image, the next set of subtracted image shows the um, um, less intense CME uh, and the near sun region. So, uh, 12 meter radio telescope uh, observations uh, have been useful to follow the active region. Also, when, uh, when observations are taken during the CME, we could uh, see the um, signatures of the CME also. <clears throat> Here, during this uh, this eruption, we could not uh, we could not um, uh, during this eruption the CM, uh, 12 meter did not uh, uh, um, um, make observation. But uh, immediately after the eruption, when the when the southern leg was uh, um, uh, uh, brightening, we we had observation. So in the 12 meter subtracted image, we could see the the leg brightening uh, seen in UV images actually. So, so this the, the the detailed analysis of this will provide the the temperature or emission measure of the um, measure of the um, foot point uh, source actually. So this was this was seen, and it it also produced a huge uh, um, fast CME. Okay. So these are all the samples. Okay, now okay, I will I will move to the, I will skip this slide. I will move to the uh, move to the um, uh, long term variation of uh, X band uh, data. So every day uh, from every day image, we took the central strip actually at the middle, something like a half beam bit uh, uh, um, strip was taken, and it was arranged for a month. This cover covers uh, April 1st to April 30th. So this is the, uh, this uh, uh, color code is the uh, central meridian brightness from South Pole to the North Pole, actually. Okay, this, uh, this co goes from South Pole to North Pole. Normally, polar region during solar minimum or close to solar minimum, they are dominated by coronal hole. They are the low emitting uh, region. And then plus minus 30 D or plus minus 35 degree uh, latitudinal belt is uh, covered by active regions. So you could see the you could see the the something like uh, plus minus 35 degree bright region, the, the yellow, green, and blue color. And also you could see some of the uh, coronal holes uh, in the uh, uh, in the central meridian of the sun. But these two regions, they correspond to strong emitting, strong expand emitting active regions, actually. So the, the uh, 12 meter uh, radio telescope um, uh, observes the band of active region as well as they prominently record the uh, uh, complex uh, magnetic active regions, actually. So. So and also one can see the there are the, there is a slight asymmetry between the uh, between this uh, uh, south polar region to the north polar region. <clears throat> so these uh, uh, maps were compared with uh, com compared with um, a thirty point nanometer uh, uh, synoptic map. So thirty point nanometer synoptic map also records the active region, highly emitting active region. But uh, they show the 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 belt of uh, belt of um, uh, sunspot uh, or active regions, moving uh, regions actually. Okay, and this is the magnetogram actually. So positive is the, uh, is the white is the positive polarity and uh, um, black uh, negative polarity. We can see the polarity reversal in the uh, south to uh, northern. Region. So, but um, the the 12 meter observations were useful. This, but the same map 
was made for more than one year actually. This covers a period between 13th December to 20th January. Uh, the central meridian strips are arranged uh, uh, sequentially. We could see the development of uh, development of uh, activity. Okay, so for example, so the the width of the width of the um, bright emitting region increases as the activity increases. Actually, so and also the coronal hole in the in the polar region they started shrinking, okay. So at this uh, solar maximum, the coronal hole uh, shrinks towards the pole, or, or they, they disappears in the south as, as well as the north polar region. So we could see the nice shrinking of the coronal hole. And also in the this map, we could see several prominent active region. They all corresponds to delta beta configuration active regions actually okay so these gaps are actually uh, maintenance period and uh, some of that and also we have dropped uh, the um, observation affected by heavy uh, cloud coverage as well as the heavy rain uh, period okay <clears throat> so this uh, we could compare this map with the with the lasco c2 brightness in the limb okay for example in the C2 uh, coronagraph, we take a, a strip at 2.5 solar EDA, and then, uh, uh, sorry, take four solar EDA, and then this map was made actually. So we could see the, this is also, the, this map also covers uh, 13th December to um, 17th January. So we could see the, uh, spreading of the spreading of the bright region or the bright regions associated with the active regions they spread towards it. so this this is the white the, these uh, images are uh, um, uh, limb brightness this is uh, uh, this is observed in um, white light thompson scattered uh, white light so they give uh, they uh, give a proxy for uh, density so these are all low density region these are all high density region so, so this is at 2.5 solar radii actually. So the, the previous one was four solar radii. This is uh, 2.5 solar radii. So in this period, the solar activity, number of sunspot, uh, uh, increased from something like uh, something like 20 to 120, and then the um, polar field, okay, polar field declining can also be seen actually. So for, whereas in the South Pole, the polar field decline is faster than the North Pole. So those, these, these things can be seen in the, in the, in the uh, 12 meter uh, um, uh, central meridian brightness. So 12 meter central meridian brightness uh, measurements are consistent with um, consistent with uh, other density measurements as well as the uh, polar field measurement. Okay, the future, the cooled resource system will provide increased sensitivity. Actually, we are planning interplanetary scintillation of compact sources, which will produce uh, solar wind velocity and the density turbulence at uh, very near the sun. In uh, that is, uh, it will give a three-dimensional view of the solar wind, and also the large frequency coverage, two to fourteen gigahertz, will provide a wide range of density scales. Actually, the frontal frontal scale sizes. Uh, um, decreases as we go from two gigahertz to fourteen gigahertz, of uh, something like uh, three to four, two or uh, two to four times actually. So that will be useful to probe uh, uh, different density um, structures in the corona. So that's the plan. And then we also plan to have make a high temporal resolution solar uh, flare profiles. And the near sun CME uh, profile uh, by tracking active region susceptible, susceptible to uh, ejection and uh, fast and wide CME. So those uh, those um, observations are being planned. Actually. Okay. So we, we, uh, the Callisto observation and the 12 meter observation gave us a uh, great encouragement to uh, prepare a proposal. The, the forecast Florida Excellence Center for Accurate Space Weather. 
predictions and uh, so we have, we have submitted a proposal to NASA. The main objective of this uh, our proposal is to bring together a team of experts in uh, solar and heliospheric physics, atmospheric and geosciences and modeling from different institutions to under and understand and predict the physical process driving the space um, uh, space weather effects between the sun and uh, earth actually. So this, uh, this uh, proposal include um, members from University of Central Florida, Arecibo Observatory, which is also part of uh, UCF, Emory Riddles, Aeronautical University, NASA Guarded Space Flight Center, John Hopkins University, Applied Physics Laboratory, and University of Colorado Naval Research Laboratory, and University of Maryland at Baltimore County. So this is a, a group effort. Okay, uh, we have submitted this. Yeah, so the, the uh, the, most of the encouragement we got from got, got from uh, Arecibo observation. Okay, I'll summarize. The regular, regular, regular monitoring of uh, Arecibo observation is essentially useful to track the formation of active, active region as well as the strong eruption leading to extreme space of the storm. So we we, we could uh, set a set a level thirteen thousand Kelvin to serve as a uh, identifier for a strong eruption active region. And deduction mapping of ultra intense flares and CMA at uh, heights close to the uh, chromosphere has been possible. The great advantage is this mapping can identify an eruptive region when it rotates close to the central meridian of the sun. As it comes close to the sun, if it is developed, then we can predict it's going to um, release Earth-directed event. So Earth-directed event can be, uh, can be uh, identified and predicted. Monitoring of the sun with the tolerometer telescope and the Callisto spectrometer is possible. Great importance to both national and international space weather research and forecasting. I think we will be continuing this observation for peak of this uh, solar cycle and uh, next to minimum of the solar cycle. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Manohan. Excellent talk. Uh, Tracy, would you take over? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, the only question I see in the chat so far, so every, uh, everyone should add their questions there, or we can also unmute you um, if you have a question you want to ask out loud. Uh, but the only question right now in the chat is from you, Chris. So do you want to ask it or do you want me to read it? Oh, you carry on. Okay. Uh, the question was, what plans do you have to expand the frequency coverage of Callisto at the high frequency end? Uh, actually, uh, uh, we wanted to install the, the, the second Callisto, which will go from something like low frequency to one gas range. Because we have a plans to extend the, uh, extend the second Callisto uh, frequency coverage by uh, installing a lock periodic antenna. So our plans are there, but at present uh, so the, the, the importance or concentration is on a, uh, on a different uh, thing. So it's being delayed actually. So we have plans for that. So next Callisto, one or two Callisto can be installed as also, yeah. Great. Um, if people have a question they want to ask out loud, they can raise their hand as well, uh, or just go ahead and unmute yourself um, or put it in the chat. In the meantime, I have a question. Um, I know that Arecibo, the Callisto at Arecibo, because there, there's a bunch of these Callistos all over. Um, the one at Arecibo seems to lead often in terms of how many of these events it picks up. Is that just good luck? Is that because it's closer to the equator or is that because um, it, uh, is operating more frequently. Um, why does that, why does the Arecibo Callisto, um, just really good at, at detecting the CMEs? So your question is what, what is the, uh, what is so important about the Arecibo Callisto? Yeah. And oh. what it usually detects a lot of events compared to even some of the other ones that are, uh, placed elsewhere. So what is it that makes the one at Arecibo, is it just luck that that happens or it's also just a good location for those types of detections? Actually, Christian Monstein is also uh, there in the uh, in the audience group, actually. He was the person uh, behind this um, uh, Callisto network, actually. Myself and Christian, we closely worked together at several places 
to install the server. Clearly, something like uh, 50 Callisto uh, spectrometers are in operation, okay, or in working condition. And the Arecibo Callisto is very important because there was a gap in this Atlantic time zone, actually. So to fill the gap, um, uh, we started discussion in 2018 or 17, 18 or 17, I think 17 or 18, we started the discussion. And then the Callisto was immediately bought and it was not installed. So when we, when our concentration moved to solar monitoring, we installed it. So the main importance is the time zone. Okay, this was not a covered. And also the, the Arecibo Callisto, uh, uh, has become the most sensitive Callisto, actually. Okay, so for example, when we compare the same uh, same radio burst observed at uh, one or uh, uh, more Callisto, Arecibo gives a, a, a high sensitivity. Okay, it was not stated by me; it was stated by Christian Monstein. Okay, <laughs> so yeah. That's great. Uh, Chris, you had your hand up. I, I uh, think yeah. Noren probably answered what I was, or probably said what I was going to say. I was going to say that uh, he, Felix, Phil, Luis, the people at Arecibo were not going to blow their own trumpet. But I had noticed that each month the Callisto, e Callisto network of about 60, I think, 60 to 70 antennas give a league table of the number of events recorded by each Callisto uh, site. And Arecibo for the past year has always either been first or second. And I think uh, that is something that most people would not be aware of. Oh, thank yeah. you. Oh, thanks, Chris. Thanks for bringing that. Yes, I, I, I yeah. And yep. also, uh, yeah, actually, Christian uh, Monstein has put the AO has a very low level of RFI, which gives good results. That's the, uh, this thing, Puerto Rico uh, radio, uh, uh, this thing, uh, radio. Yep. Frequency zone, interference. Yeah. That, gives a, that gives a very good, yeah. Because we, we, have, we have installed the Callisto in the Arecibo Observatory staging area, yeah. Christian, did you want to add anything else? I saw that you put that answer in the chat about the low level of RFI, but did you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, uh, beside the low level of RFI, it's also the quality of the antenna. It's LWA, the long wavelength antenna, which has very dedicated electronics at the front end. So this really helps to increase the number of bursts, which can be detected compared to other stations which just have a dipole or a very simple Yari antenna or LPDA. So the LWA is a really good antenna for this kind of solar burst observations. That's great. And then I see in the chat that Stephen White wrote, uh, that was his impression looking at uh, the dynamic spectra from Arecibo compared to the LWA data. Uh, Phil. Yeah, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. When we had the antenna up on the 12 meter, we couldn't use it. There was so much RFI. It's only because we buried it down in that hole in the staging area that we got such a, a good response. So the RFI is there, but our shielding is really helping out. And the other thing I'd like to point out is, yeah, we could have a lot of detections, but it's hard to beat Alaska in the summertime when they have like 20 hours of daylight. Because we're in a hole, we actually are limited for the number of days, number of hours we can actually see the sun. Yeah, I think that makes it even more interesting then that it is detecting so many, um, as Chris said, in the in the charts that show how the frequency of detections. Um, so if Arecibo has a shorter time frame to actually do those detections and still is detecting more than a lot of the other locations, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Any other questions? Last chance. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, if not, uh, let's thank again, uh, Pique Manoran for that wonderful talk about all of the really cool um, capabilities of studying our sun with the Arecibo Observatory. Yeah, because again, I want to I want to emphasize. Okay, we, these type of observations are uh, really important actually. Because the one year, if the one year or one year two months of observation, we could see the the uh, development of solar activity with the twelve meter antenna, and also uh, because it's still the, the the huge amount of data is there. I welcome. Okay, anyone interested in studying uh, solar radio astronomy and then uh, want to do some uh, solar radio uh, uh, data analysis or I, I, uh, studies, I welcome them actually. Okay, we have a very, and also we will be making the data available. Okay, I'm, I'm running after uh, Arun to uh, put the data on the website actually, yes. Aitil, thank you very much. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, please be on the lookout for the next uh, ASAP uh, invitation for a lunchtime talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete.